Hi, everybody. We're live ahead of the Australian Grand Prix qualifying a little bit earlier than usual. That way we can capture our friends in North America and Europe who might be setting their lineups before bed. But also for people who are going to stay up and watch qualifying later, you can watch us on demand and get all your questions answered in the same spot. Rob, good day to you. How does it feel to be getting ready for your home race? It is it is my home race, Adam, but given I'm not currently living in Australia at the moment, it maybe feels a little bit disconnected. But notwithstanding that, always great to see Australia roll around on the calendar. Uh, really exciting race. I know a lot of people from back home heading down to Melbourne this year. So I think it's going to be a really good race weekend. A lot of interesting things that unfolded in free practice one and two. And I think that means we've got a lot of discussion points for today. Yeah, let's start with that big news right away. So for anyone who's been living under a rock, Logan Sargent's not participating in the rest of the weekend. Alex Albon had the shunt in free practice, damaged the chassis beyond repair. Williams didn't carry a third chassis this week, leaving them with just one available car. They made the choice to put Alex in Logan's car and have Logan sit out with the hopes that Alex can get some points for them. Rob, how do you think that's going to impact Alex's day? And also, what are some of the immediate fantasy impacts of that too? Yeah, I think Williams definitely made a business decision to put Albon in over Logan. I can understand Logan's disappointment and obvious frustrations with the decision made, but I think that opportunity for Albon to score is, at least score some points is probably the best chance for that team in Australia. Uh, I think fantasy-wise, anyone with Logan in their team, he won't be scoring any points. I think in most situations, he would be an instant transfer out. However, given that there is some risk with this circuit, a historical DNF rate, a few incidents in practice ones and two, would a zero points for Logan Sargent be the worst outcome for a budget driver at a circuit like this? It's a question we've been getting a lot all day today, If, if especially if you've used your transfers for the week already and moving Sargent out for, say, a Batas, who's the next cheapest driver, is taking the minus 10 worth it for someone who probably won't even clear 10 points? Probably not. So I, I think that question is going to come up quite a bit. Definitely, definitely. I think as well for Albon, you know, he, he comes to a circuit which he had a, an exceptional result at in 2022, but uh, obviously didn't finish the race last season and had a, had an incident at the same turn he crashed at 12 months prior in practice one. So there is some cause for pessimism for, for Alex Albon in a Williams that doesn't seem to really look like the car that was on show 12 months prior. What's interesting about Albon is that he also rode off a car on that exact turn last season. And so this is why there's so much pressure on him this weekend. He's taking his partner's car. He's crashed twice on the same corner. He has to finish this race. If he doesn't score points, we understand how difficult this course can be. We know that the Williams isn't the best car in the track, but he cannot crash on that turn a third time because hindsight's 2020. And I think the media will be coming after them pretty hard for the decision. Definitely. I think while we're on the topic of Williams, um, and hello to everyone that's uh, obviously greeted us in the chat, but Mike's made a great point around a sergeant on our team without a penalty. Adam, do you want to walk me through your point of view on that so far? Sure. So at this point, if you go onto the app right now, you'll see a warning message that Ali Behrman's been made inactive and science is back in. But there's also a little footnote that sergeant isn't participating in the race. Then when you go to the driver cards, Sargent is still active. You can pick him in the game. That's useful for people because he's the cheapest asset and that allows you more budget flexibility to do other things. Now, I don't think Sargent is going to score any negative points this week. Let's go backwards from the race. Last year, we had this issue where Lance Stroll didn't participate in Singapore. So I found Article 42.4 of the Sporting Regulations that says the grid is finalized four hours before the formation lap. If you are on that grid, you need to complete 90% of the race laps or else you're going to not classify anything withdraw any withdrawals before that you won't have that issue. So I don't expect minus 20 for not classifying the race. Then we were talking with Terry a little while ago, and we all sort of agreed that by not participating in qualifying, he doesn't have to behold himself to the 107% rule. So by not even lining up to start qualifying, he shouldn't get the minus five for an NC in that event either. So I think all roads point to him getting a zero for the week, which might be better if you have a team with Logan Sargent on it than using uh, 10 points to transfer him out for another cheap driver. 
Yeah, fully agree. And we saw a very similar situation to this in Singapore last year where Lance Stroll withdrew before um, the weekend really took shape and he ended the weekend on zero points too. So if that's anything to go by, he could well be a, an ideal budget option if you're not willing to chance your hand with DNFs, which can really cripple your team in that budget category. Absolutely. And, and I can see uh, there's some chatter in the chat about Valtteri because he would have been the next cheapest driver. And he's basically winning everything off the track this week. That Uber commercial was incredible. All the Australia posters have Ricardo, Piastri and Valtteri on them as, as the adopted son. So definitely a, a race where Valtteri could be featured pretty prominently. Definitely. Definitely. Do we want to take a look at the free practice times? Now, yes. speaking while, of... while you pull that up, Rob, I forgot the obvious ground rules. We've got two things for you over on the FanAmp app. One is to comment who you think will win driver of the day. Will it be a Ferrari? Because they've taken it the last two weeks. Carlos Sainz is coming back on very, very short notice from his appendectomy. Could he get a sentimental driver of the day? So let us know who you think will win in our FanAmp base. And also start sending those lineups into us because we'll be pulling those up soon. All through our base on FanAmp. So I think free practice one and two, I would say somewhat similar, but not exactly the same in terms of results. Uh, I really liked um, the sign of Ferrari continuing to look close to the top of the timing charts. Uh, and Leclerc in particular seems to be featuring around that mark, top four, top five, through all practice sessions and qualifying we've seen so far this season. Uh, and then Max, obviously another uh, familiar face, uh, at the top there. Were there any particular standouts outside of the usual suspects to you, Adam, that um, surprised you or underwhelmed? Not really. I, I was interested to see Lance Stroll so high up there in free practice too. Yuki was up there in both free practices. But I think for me, the the presence of Charles Leclerc in the top three in both free practice one and free practice two gets me excited about the prospects of Ferrari. You're going to see a common theme throughout all of our lineup advice and our lineups. Rob and I need to get out of the RV constructor and bring in Ferrari. So how do we do that? Um, probably bringing Verstappen out as the 2X driver, and Charles could be that 2X driver for us this week. So a very validating P1 and FP2 that you're seeing here. Yeah, definitely. And one one thing that um, I've, I've given some thought to, and Mike and others have also mentioned on Twitter and such around Ferrari, or you've also talked about it to great lengths as well, Adam, the driver of the day potential for Ferrari, particularly from what we've seen from Carlos and Behrman in the first two races. And I think given that Max, assuming he wins, and Perez, if he features in the top two, are foregone conclusions to not win that because that's kind of expected to where they finish. Anything lower than that, that they score is not really driver of the day territory for those Red Bull drivers. So I'm thinking if Leclerc looks great in qualifying, he gets pole. Yeah, even if he comes second, I wouldn't rule out a driver of the day for him there, even if Max ultimately wins the race. So I really like that thinking perhaps as to whether or not that could factor into Leclerc as a potential 2X this week. I heard a really crazy stat, Rob. Max has shared more front rows with Charles Leclerc than Lewis Hamilton. Huh. New now generation. you wouldn't you wouldn't know it because poor Charles coughed up a lot of those pole positions to to Max victories, but it's it's proving that he can really qualify the heck out of that Ferrari. And if he can break away from Max, he'll avoid some of those weird accidents that afflicted them last year. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the car itself looks so much better than where it was twenty twenty three and even parts of twenty twenty two as well. And from what we've seen, I've looked at some of the telemetry as well through the first two practice sessions. The car just seems across the board. A, a really competitive car comp against the Red Bull. I think, you know, they've looked in all sections of the track or in all parts as well of racing, braking, cornering, great traction control. Um, I just think it works in favor of Charles. And I think if if Max even looks a little bit off the pace, then, you know, I, I don't think just a pole position, but a P1 on Sunday could also be a realistic possibility. Yeah, I'm certainly optimistic about them too. Let's see. And, you know, maybe that's a good transition, Rob, to some of the sim data, because, you know, how do we translate those short runs versus the long runs in free practice into what that could mean for the events this weekend? Ferrari actually have the fastest qualifying sim pace, followed closely by Red Bull. What's interesting is that bottom of the top 10, where you have Mercedes, who have now slipped behind Aston Martin and McLaren, and RB, who are appearing to be the best of the rest. But I don't know about you, Rob, I'm not buying it. 
No, not at all. I think RB have shown us through two races. They just don't really have it to scrap with the bottom of the top five. And even though they look pretty isolated in P6 in the quality and race simulation pace, I'll take us down to the race simu- simulation as well. There's just been nothing to suggest from Ricardo and Sonoda that they are going to put in an otherworldly performance. They and I talked about this in my my latest video on my own channel that they are just a car that typically makes it into Q2 and they just sit there the whole race. They might make the odd overtake, but they're not really moving more than a spot above or below what their starting grid position is. So fantasy-wise, it just doesn't seem to me as though there's a lot of points scoring upside there. And that obviously translates to budget increases too. So if you're not scoring more than five points in a race weekend, that doesn't necessarily eventuate into price increases either. It's a great point, Rob. And I'll be interested to see can we get all of the RB assets out of our lineup or do we have to stick it out with one of the drivers? Hope they don't get stuck in a situation like in Jetta where they were just behind Magnuson for all of the race, impossible to overtake, couldn't get into the points positions led to a bad day for drivers and constructors alike. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, that's the first, the, the RB constructor is the first asset out of my team this week, no matter how you try and um, script it. So looking forward to locking in these transfers. I don't think I'll be doing it on stream. I might just wait until free practice three, but I think notwithstanding that I'll have a, hopefully a pretty good idea of um, where I want to go by the end of this stream. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely give you a good look at where I'm leaning shy of somebody pulling a, a Joe or another Albon incident where a car is unusable. We just want to buffer against if something like that happens. But I, I think mm. I'm pretty confident in my team right now. Mm-hmm. There was a question earlier in the chat about what could this mean? If you run Sergeant, what would the potential price change be for a driver in your lineup to get zero points? Uh, I could, I won't say 100% sure, but if he finishes the race with zero points, if we're assuming that, I, I mean, I'm not going to say I know how this works entirely, the mechanics of their pricing changes, but if, if any driver this season has scored zero in a race weekend, their price has gone down. Now, I don't know if that necessarily factors into whether or not the driver actually has to race to run. And I could probably check if if Stroll saw a price change after his... Um, they, they just reported in the chat that he didn't last he year. Didn't, he didn't move in price. Okay, well then... I wouldn't think the price would change as a result either, unless you're of the view otherwise. No, uh, I'm in the same boat as you. And I just looked over at the F1 Fantasy Tools price sim. It assumes he scores zero and changes zero in price. So I think there's an assumption that with with Logan being the least priced asset on the grid, even if he went down a little bit, it would be very little compared to your your high-end assets. Now, I really want to talk about price changes as well because we are at that juncture where everyone's rushing to get Max, Red Bull, and Ferrari into their team as soon as possible. Uh, and I think we, we should also probably look at a couple of lineups when we go through the price changes and what that means for our teams into the next few weeks. But kind of where is your head at right now? Do you think there's a – is there would you make the case in favor of chasing price increases, chasing points, somewhere in the middle? Because a lot of people are grappling with that and whether or not they need to use the wild card this week because of better value assets that they could hopefully capitalize on to move their budget further up. I'm trying to lean it somewhere in the middle with a high upside points and budget increase team. For example, I want Ferrari in my lineup on the side of Red Bull. I don't care what the potential is for Aston Martin to grow in value. I need the points from Ferrari. But on the flip side, with Charles Leclerc, he allows me to run Lance Stroll. And the combined budget increase potential, Charles Leclerc and Lance Stroll, is greater than Perez and pick a budget driver. So that is weighing heavily into the the top half of my lineup. So Hmm. I'm trying to to hedge my bets between the two. What about you, Yeah, quite similar, in fact. Uh, And I think Ferrari Construct is really going to help us move up the ranks just a little bit given anything's better than RB at the moment. But uh, I'm, yeah, very much of a similar boat. The simulation or the price simulation changes for Leclerc and Perez are pretty similar, but Stroll does look like one of the most undervalued assets in the game. And he was looking really good through practice last week uh, or last race in Saudi Arabia, had it not been for that DNF 
Uh, a pretty similar story this time around as well. He's looked really great. Uh, P5 and P6, a uh, P7 and P6, sorry, through two practice sessions. There's maybe a little bit of skewed information because the Aston Martin uh, rear wing, when it's open for DRS, seems to provide a pretty advantageous position for the car compared to some of the others around them. So maybe that makes their speed look a little bit better than probably what's actually the case on race day. Um, but I still think that the Aston Martin is moving in the right direction. And uh, I was definitely confident on Stroll for Saudi Arabia. And I seem to have a similar point of view this time around. Yeah, and I think with Lance, he stands to gain the most price, according to the F1 Fantasy Tools Sim. He's also one of the least owned drivers. So what will happen is if you run with Lance, he has a big day will be in the minority of teams that get a cost cap boost and a points boost from it. If you have an incident like Jetta where he puts himself into the wall, you're going to have that points deficit and the price deficit. And that will be unique to you compared to other teams. So that's that's the risk you and I run. We both crashed yeah. over with them last week. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's just been pointed out that, you know, he doesn't have the best race craft going around and as has that kind of accident prone tendency too. So I have, you know, some skepticism, but... You know, I, I do want to try and remain as optimistic around some of these drivers as possible if I've got them in my team because we have a little bit of rank to, to claw back. Do we want to quickly take a look at lineups for five minutes before we get Terry in unless there's uh, anything else you want to address in the meantime? No, I think that's a good time to look. It's going to bring a lot of these concepts all together we've been talking mm. about. Mm. So the first one we've got is from uh, a previous winner of the Fan Amp prize, Harrison F. Hood. He's got a lineup consisting of what I'll probably run quite similar of Leclerc, Stroll, Hulkenberg, Albon, Joe, and Rebel Ferrari double up in the constructors. What's your point of view there, Adam? I'm perfectly happy with this lineup. Hulkenberg has completed in this race. He's competed in this race twice dating back to 2019, both P7s. So maybe Hulk has some magic at this track. I like Joe as the better of the two Sauber drivers. Not sure if I'll be able to get him into my lineup, though, so I might have to be running Valtteri either way. And then that's the Leclerc, Stroll, high points upside, high price upside we talked about a moment ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really liking all of these. Uh, I probably, if, if I'm deciding over Hulkenberg and Magnussen, which both drove very well in Saudi Arabia, the better qualifying performances we see from Hulk typically probably detracts me between the two. So I'm not suggesting Hulk suddenly a bad fantasy pick. He's looked great through two races, but um, I can't really fault anyone in this team, to be honest. As long as the Haas can maintain their position in the race, then I think they make for a pretty sensible and reliable option. Agreed. Oh, I know this name. <laughs> A uh, friend of the show, Terry, F1 Coffee Corner, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, a pretty pretty similar color scheme I'm seeing in this lineup, Adam. What's your what's your thoughts? Looks like the same thing all the way down, except Valtteri over Joe and Sonoda over Albon. I like this lineup perfectly fine. I'm not sure how Albon's going to get along in a car that they're just putting together now. So I do like Yuki a little bit better than Alex this week. But again, mm. only so many moves I can make this week. I might be running him one way or another. Yeah, I mean, I've got Bottas in my team as well, and he's obviously suffered a couple of unfortunate price drops because of the less than favorable scores of, I think, zero and minus one the last couple of weeks. So uh, I really hope he, as an, adop an adopted Australian, puts in a good performance. He, as you pointed out in the race week preview show, has got a pretty reliable record uh, in the last few races at Albert Park. So I, I know and I would agree with you that those two, uh, the, the both the Sauber drivers, um, you'd, you'd probably take Joe over them. But I, I think Bottas probably gets um, ignored a little bit in 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 the fantasy landscape. And as someone who I could well be running this weekend, I, I don't hate him, to be quite honest. Just that need to fix that blasted wheel nut. <laughs> yes, yes. If they can have one race where all the pit stops are good, let's say under 40 seconds, I'd take that. <laughs> Wonderful. And just a reminder to everybody, before we bring Terry on, our contest is still open. We'll be picking a winner in about 25 minutes or so. There aren't a ton of entries yet, so your odds are good if you entered right now. So head on over there and get a chance to win a 5th Gear Garms gift card. I am rocking some more 5th Gear Garms with one of my favorite Mercedes liveries. 
I'm trying to get the name and the team in in the shot here, but uh, I think this again looks quite similar to maybe Team One that we just reviewed. Yeah, identical, I think. Except, um, yeah, it is identical. Except Joe over Valtteri. Valtteri, yeah, it's just the two Sauber drivers. So this very is good. Much a fan. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing a lot agreement. of themes. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of themes. So thanks for the submission, Dave Bergeron. Um, another friend of the show, Mike. Adam, t- take it away. <laughs> Uh, Mike, it looks like another another great team you've got here. And this time you've got Gasly instead of the the rotating spot of what had been a Haas driver in some of the other lineups. I like Gasly as a price gainer this week. Obviously, that Alpine is a tractor, but you're just hoping that he can survive and gain a few places out the course of the race. And he's going to gain that price. Him and Ocon have spread in terms of both points and value these last few weeks. I think he's due for for a little game this week. And also this is a duo that needs to wash away the sins of this race last year on the last restart, they came together and, and really ruined the day for Alpine. So we need a clean day from them. <laughs> I, I was trying to stifle a laugh when you're like the current objective for an Alpine is simply survive, which probably gives me a little bit of a cause for concern, but you're absolutely not wrong with that assessment. I, I think they're they're really not going to make it out of Q1 or I find it very hard to see them doing so. And, you know, if they can just get to the checkered flag, there's at least, I think, five points, fantasy points there for Alpine to pick up minimum. If you're even going from a P20, a P19 to like a P14, P15, throw in a couple of overtakes, it's not a bad result. And, you know, the the magic number in fantasy for a price rise seems to be around like six or seven points, right? So... That's all Gasly needs to kind of get back into the winner's circle and get that bump. For anybody who didn't remember the bottom of the simulation table, Alpine dead last, qualifying pace, dead last, race pace. So the, they're going to be trundling around the back of the pack and hopefully they can get a few places there. Rob, should we bring on Terry? Sure, let's come back to this lineup. We've got uh, after Terry because we've got a couple of them on screen here. But um, yeah, let's let's bring Terry in and we'll pick lineups afterwards. Wonderful. Terry, welcome back for anybody who hasn't met Terry before. He is <laughs> the man behind F1 Coffee Corner, the Full Beans podcast, and the Tech Corner articles on fanamp.com. Terry, welcome back. Thank you. I'm enjoying being inside for once. <laughs> yeah, you're not. In, you're not in the usual I'm man probably, cave. No, I'm not. No, I decided to come indoors since it's late in the UK. <laughs> oh, wonderful, Terry. I want to start with the news of the week. We have Logan that's missing this race because Williams only brought two chassis. How is that possible? Um, <laughs> it's it's a rookie error. Let's be honest about it. Um, from what we're seeing and what we've heard, King Val's been talking quite a bit about it. He's done um a few question and answer sessions for um, some of the sponsors as well on one of the pop-up shops where he goes into a bit more sort of detail about it. And it seems like when it comes to the start of the season, they were behind with their production. They didn't have enough parts. So they prioritized getting the cars ready and out to Bahrain um, for pre-season testing. Obviously they had two at that point. And it seems like the third one, the spare one was put on the back burner whilst they prioritized other things along the way. And what they've been waiting for is a gap i.e. the European races to get it across and, and in, into the, the paddock rather than spending a lot of the cost cut money on shipping it on its own over. And that's what it looks like it's happened. So it's not been ready because they've been waiting. They've played a bit of a gamble and it's kind of spectacularly backfired from what I can gather looking at it because you haven't changed the chassis from the start of the season. So there's no design change. So it's not like they've waited for a part or anything with it. They've just put it on the back burner waiting for that gap save money, but ultimately it could cost them money when you've only got one car now running. It, they've made quite a tactical error with this because they've got they've even survived this long without having a crash and having to need it. The first race of the season usually has a lot of DNFs. Jet is a street circuit. That sometimes brings up some DNFs. So they, it was really playing with fire to get to this point before you needed it. And now you have to run one driver down. Yeah, and um, the bigger point now is that that's going to go back to the UK well, it's gone back now. It's been shipped back now, um, flown back. And that means you've now got to potentially get two ready for Japan and back out. So you haven't actually saved them any at all because it's now back in the UK and they're both going back out. So in the long term, Williams have kind of made a bad decision and shot themselves in the foot. Well, the- Go ahead, I, was, I was just going to I was just going to quickly jump in. What do you think that means? Like if we're looking at Sergeant, who's been pulled from the team in terms of the belief or lack of that vows and, and company of 
have really demonstrated from this decision. What do you think that means for Sargent, not just for the rest of the season, but beyond their confidence and whether or not he can actually get the job done? I think it's huge. I mean, you're effectively saying that we don't believe you're going to get points over your teammates. So it's one of those business-wise, everyone can see why, why they've done it. But from a confidence point of view, if you're Logan Sargent and you're fighting for your place next season, we know Alex has got a contract. Logan hasn't. And he would have been set a target for this season. He would have been, I'm sure, tasked with getting some points. Ultimately, this is a confidence knocker. Whereas if you'd shown the confidence in him, what if you know Logan had gone out and got points in the Williams that we know is capable of getting points? Actually, that could have been a turnaround, a monumental turnaround for Williams, knowing that the confidence in him. So it's one of those where it's going to be interesting to see how they come back from it because I'm not sure Logan, he seems very confidence driven. I think he's going to struggle now with this decision. I mean, publicly, he will be playing the, the Williams line as we see him from the statements, but inside, he's going to be hurting with that decision, surely. And as far as the decision of why they pulled Logan from the car and put Alex in, is it simply just a numbers game of Alex gives us a better chance to get points of the 28 Williams points last year, Alex scored 27 of them so that they can get a little bit higher in the constructor standings, maybe get a little bit more prize money and put themselves in a better position and not have this happen again. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's actually hard to work for what they're doing because we know that Alex destroyed the gearbox and he destroyed the engine. So they've got to replace that anyway. Um, so that's obviously a bigger task than stripping Logan's down because obviously according to the rules, he can't use the engine that was in Logan's car. All that's going to be stripped out back to the chassis, then started again with parts from Alex's side. So it's actually a monumental job what they're doing. It's it's a lot harder to strip it down and, and make it Alex's car than what it actually would have been to carry on with Logan. So it's purely done on points, purely done, I'm sure, for the hope that Alex can get points at the end of the season. Constructors points means more prize money. And ultimately, that's, that's what they're looking at. Yeah, I mean, you look at how well Albon drove for Williams last year, carried that team single-handedly the whole way through. I mean, we we did talked about it before, Adam and I, around his performance there last year where he obviously crashed on the same turn. He, he had that incident in FP1 uh, less than 24 hours ago. Do you think there's any hope for points for Williams this this weekend? I, I feel like there's just too much clutter going on in the uh, the top half of the grid to give them any real chance. I feel like it's a tall order, actually, looking at all of the simulations as well, looking at their first two races, even without the troubles they had, you kind of still expect um, the V-carbs to come into play a bit with, with Yuki and Daniel. So I might even think it's a bit risky to even think that Alex is going to get points when you look at the teams above. And there's that factor of, what if he goes out in qualifying or FP3 and does exactly the same thing? Actually, they're going to look monumentally with egg on their face if that, if that happens, that's for sure. So it is risky. Like I say, I understand the business reasons behind it. Personally, it's not one that I agree with. Alex made the call. He got it wrong. They knew before they went out that they only had one chassis. So drivers would have known that. So, yeah, it's, it's a tough call on Logan, that's for sure. Terry, I want to switch gears because you highlighted in your Tech Corner article this week a couple of the upgrades that have come onto the grid. You talked about these winglets for Ferrari, and at the time you weren't sure what the impact would be on performance, but Ferrari's come out and really blown the doors off us this weekend. Do you think the winglets played a factor into it? And if not, what is contributing to this Ferrari success? Um, I think the Ferrari looks a lot more stable this year. I think they've they've maybe lost a bit of that top speed they had last year in terms of winning that pace. Um, which we're seeing teams like Williams struggle with the same thing as well as they, they go out that area. These winglets are quite interesting. They're just on the on the back by the exhaust. They look like they, they are literally just there to direct the flow of air just ever so slightly away from something. It's either away from something or towards something, but whatever it's doing clearly isn't hampering the Ferrari at all. Um, it is very, they are very small. I mean, they've been zoomed in loads and loads of times and they, they look absolutely tiny, but enough to be on the upgrade list, enough that Ferrari have got a bit of faith in them. And actually, they do think that, you know, it's making a difference. I think what it might just be doing is just stabilising that that loose rear end a bit more for them and also helping if it's direct in the air. The only thing you can think of that's also going to help with their tyre degradation, which we know they've had problems with as well. So it might even be doing slightly better with that as well. I mean, on the, on the topic of that, you know, they, they have looked awfully competitive through all three races even if they haven't come close to winning the race yet but um it is a, a point that i mentioned before that adam's talked about a little bit too and is also thematically um 
the fifth gig arms question of the week is whether or not a Ferrari driver is in the box seat for the driver of the day. <laughs> is there any inkling that you might think that could realistically be a chance after Sainz and Behrman the last two races? Um, I've seen in chat, you know, obviously Sainz, if he does a good job, um, we know he's driving, he doesn't look in any any discomfort or I say in discomfort, he's been in discomfort, but he's certainly not looking at any doubt to have to be a driver as such um, this weekend from what we're hearing and seeing. So I think Sainz, if he, he gets within the points of good position, there might be a bit of sentimental vote for it. I think Charles is going to have a good weekend from the look of it. He looks strong. Certainly the stronger out the two Ferraris in terms of most likely to to chase after you know, Red Bull and, and the win, that's for sure. But I think they're, they're geared up for everything we're seeing for a strong weekend. Terry, we had a question in the chat from Ray about Mercedes, and they clearly look off the pace in the free practice session so far. You can see them just cling to the bottom of the top 10 in the race in quali sims. There was a quote from Hamilton after P FP2 where he said, quote, after that session, I feel the least confident I've ever felt with this car. What can we expect from Mercedes this weekend, and are they able to adjust between now and qualifying? Um, Mercedes have clearly got a problem with win tunnel correlation to track we know you know frustrating we've heard about it for a couple of years now they're struggling with something they're running a lot of setups to get data lewis clearly seems to be doing a lot more of that i don't know if there's a reason why the the only thing i can think of is they want george as a benchmark and there's been some criticism was on social media saying we're only doing it to one car why is it lewis well actually it makes sense because you keep one car with your benchmark of what you're going to get and you change the settings on the other car to see what difference it's making. So it makes perfect sense to do that with only one car. Um, we tend to see it the other way around with Mercedes. We seem to see them meddle more in FP3 in qualifying and have a strong Friday. We're kind of seeing it reverse in Australia. Whether or not that might play into it, but they're not showing us any signs they're going to break into that, that top with the performance that we're seeing from McLaren in long runs, what we're seeing from Aston Martin in terms of yeah, the fast pace, you've touched on DRS. So... I think that from that point of view, they're still they're not going to be able to find enough pace in that in that W15 to challenge those ones, unless there's an incident with a safety car, which you know seventy percent chance in Australia of a full safety car might come into play a bit. Yeah, I mean, particularly interesting to me is the fact that Russell's look much stronger than Hamilton across the first two practice sessions. You could maybe even argue that from what we've seen across the entire season so far is. Is this something you expect to continue? Usually I find Hamilton can turn it around. I mean, part and parcel goes with the car and how that develops too, which we're thinking might see some upgrades by race five, six, seven. Do you think Russell's got the the upper hand for the foreseeable future or do you think Lewis can fix this? Um, I think George has got the, got the upper hand probably till we get towards Imola and the European ones. Um, I think Lewis has to have everything dialed in to, to go that extra. He seems to be a driver who likes everything to be exactly perfect. And whereas George, I feel, can probably, you know, his time at Williams probably helped in that sense, can kind of drive within a, a tolerance a lot more. Whereas I think Lewis has almost been spoiled by the Mercedes in the past of being absolutely toned in and being able to fix it if it's slightly wrong. I think now he's, he's struggling in that sense of it just doesn't feel right. And I don't think he's quite sure how to get it. And I think he's continually chasing it because that's what he wants that perfection. So I think he chased it a lot more rather than I think George will fall into that compromise of I can just do a good job from the package I've got. I think Lewis is continuously trying to, to chase after that optimum performance that may not be there because of it. It's a bummer to hear as a Mercedes fan, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to interrupt this flow for a second because there's some breaking news that came out in the chat that I just confirmed. Logan Sargent is inactive in the game yeah, now. Yeah. So if you haven't picked him yet, you can't. And if you have picked him, it's guaranteed zero. So could change some of the strategy a little bit if some of you were considering taking the free zero for the extra budget flexibility. Yeah, I, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I don't think that many people were running Sergeant unless they were very, <laughs> very short on budget. And I, I mean, he's he's certainly a much improved fantasy wise this year than he was say twelve months prior. But I think uh, from what we've talked about so far, it, there are certainly better options out there at that kind of five and a half to seven million price bracket. 
Terry, I want to hit you with a question about tires because we're okay. running the softest compounds in the line this weekend. And I think this is the softest of the soft that they've run. What is that? What do you think that will do to pit stop strategy? Because this is a traditionally one stop race. Do you think we could open to a second stop race now? Um, it is the softest. So this is the C5 is the softest that we got. We're going to see track evolution because we always do when we're now over park. So yeah, the, the more with the support races, there's quite a lot of support races that go on to it. Lays down a lot of rebel. The tracks get faster and faster, obviously. Um, in terms of stops, we're still predicting a one stop, but it is borderline. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, last year we had that very early safety car and you were able to do that very long stint on, on the hard compound. Everyone kind of pitted and went long distance. We don't think that you're going to be able to do that. So if there is an early safety car, it is going to mess with the strategy. We don't think the hards are going to last long enough if that happens this time. So if it's a traditional sort of race without the safety car interruptions, it probably should still be a one stop. If there's an early safety car, it might open up. And also just depends what those soft tires, how they last, because the teams haven't had a lot of running on them at all. So it is a softer compound, but they are still predicting one stop at the moment. Do, do you think as well, uh, Max and Charles aside, which seem to be the two most prominent names on the the timing sheets through two practice sessions do you think fp3 qualifying will spring any surprises close to the top and um, track evolution possibly i mean i think the race simulations look look pretty so sort of what we've got where mclaren will, mclaren will be faster race pace than aston martin but aston martin should be faster qualifying pace and same with sort of v carb and and that side of it as well so i think what we're seeing we, we're going to see I think Mercedes into the mix is going to be one which, if they can change them on the setup, they've got the potential to throw something in there. But I think it's still going to be around that. I think you're going to have Red Bull, you're going to have Ferrari, and then you're going to get that sort of in, in the middle there with that Aston Martin, that McLaren, kind of slogging out between the race and qualifying for almost best of the rest. But it depends, obviously, what Checo and things can do. And I think also qualifying, we're going to have blocking playing a big part as, as I said, the track the track's going to ramp up and ramp up. So if you're late going out, you're going to get better time, but you then run that risk because if you haven't got the time set and you get blocked, you're not going to qualify. So it is going to be a game of cat and mouse with the traffic as well. That can make for some really interesting fantasy outcomes. If you have surprises in qualifying because of the blocking and the track evolution, yeah. then you could have overtaking on Sunday or middle of the night, Saturday, wherever it is for you. And it, it could really open up some of these budget drivers. Cause I think a lot of our teams, like including yours that we saw earlier are running three, four budget drivers at the bottom. So we're hoping for some big scoring for them for once. Yeah. I think qualifying is going to be key because we've seen it in the past where, where we've had blocking incidents at Albert Park. We've had, you know, cars, you know, qualify towards the end, uh, hassle someone go out, get that last lap just before the check a flag. Suddenly, you know, really high position, knock someone out. So, I think it's going to be really interesting, certainly from a fancy formula point of view, where you can actually get some overtakes in there. Yeah, walk me through your your picks for this week, Terry. We covered your team, as Adam mentioned before, <laughs> and I I mean I'm not I'm, this is not a knock of your team at all because you and I are going to have probably quite a similar bill by the time the deadline arrives. But <laughs> but, but walk me through some of your picks. Did I actually see the wild card? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you did. I went with a brush. I can't even remember what I had before. I just had to get rid of that RV that and just went went <laughs> for it. Um, and to be honest, when I did it, it kind of said that I was going to lose 60 points. So I thought I put a wild card in and just do it that way. <laughs> but yeah, my, my thinking is, I think I said to Adam earlier, you know, Ribbon and Ferrari are going to be strong. Yeah, Charles, I think he's a safer bet than, than Checo from that point of view. Bottas and... and yeah, the, the kick as we are. I'll keep one called, we just call them Salva. Let's be honest about it. It just gets confusing. I think they're going to perform okay around here. They've brought an upgrade to the front wing. It looks it looks a, a lot better. Um, hopefully, they're not going to have problems with their pit stops. Um, I haven't got good news for you on that front. Unfortunately, that fix isn't here until Japan for the wheel net. So be prepared. There might be a long Salva pit stop somewhere, unfortunately. Yikes. Um, yeah, afraid to go. I'm sorry. You know, it's it's not here yet. It's not ready. <laughs> so okay. Um, well, I, I was gonna. I was gonna potentially yeah, run double it's, it's sour. A risk. It's a risk. It's <laughs> um, definitely no a risk. I mean, if, if there's no pit stops, they'd be fine. But unfortunately, they've got to do at least one, and it could all, all go horribly wrong. But you do you do an Alex Albon from 2022, run the whole race, and then pit on the very last lap, and hope <laughs> to God it works out somehow. Yeah, 40 <laughs> seconds later. <laughs> 
And for, for when you talk about using the wild card, it's one of the few chips I'd advocate for using in the first part of the season. If you're going to lose minus 10, minus 20, or in your case, minus 60 points, <laughs> make that change. <laughs> Don't be afraid to make that change. And because later in the season, we're going to start settling into a meta lineup. You're going to lament not using the wild card earlier because that's exactly what happened to Rob and I last year. So I may if if the budget drivers don't fit the way i want them to use the wild card but i think right now because i carried a third transfer i've got just enough flexibility to get a team that'll work for me yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very much the same I, I mean i'm yeah definitely not shaming terry's wild card mike <laughs> what you said in the chat because there's absolutely a case to use it this weekend i i like adam have three so it's almost a mini wild card to deploy this week with three trades and I think if you're getting to a point where you're taking minus 20s and minus 30s, et cetera, then that's a good a case as any to use it. I think minus 10, you want to be sure if you're taking that and not using the wild card that, that will ab you're able to claw those points back over a couple races. But I, I'm seeing a lot of people use it this weekend. So I think now that, as you say, Adam, the meta lineup is shifting in a particular direction, I think it's a good a time as any to, to use it. Yeah, I, I thought minus 60 definitely called for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Terry, any final thoughts before we get back to lineup reviews for the week? Um, no, I don't think so. Like I say, it's it's pretty much you know, what we said. I, I think the McLaren's going to be a strong round here. I think if anyone's sort of toying with them um, over Mercedes, I'll probably put McLaren over Mercedes this weekend from what I'm seeing, most definitely. Next couple of tracks are definitely going to suit McLaren. Um, this one and Japan should also suit McLaren and how they are anyway, just naturally from what we've seen from the car so far. So I think if anyone's making a switch or thinking about it, I'll certainly put the McLarens, you know, either driver. I wouldn't say one's better than the other at the moment, but certainly either driver, if you can afford to make that switch or you're stuck in it, then definitely it's probably worth certainly playing for the next couple of races. That's for sure from what we're seeing. That's great. Terry, thank you so much for your insights thank again. You please be sure to check out Terry on F1 Coffee Corner and the Tech Corner um, uh, articles that he posts on fan app every week i started i got my eyes over to the chat and then all of a sudden my brain just i'll say the hard reset <laughs> multitasking <laughs> oh my goodness terry thank you for everything thank you guys thanks terry that was a fun session always is with terry i have one eye on terry and one eye on hakan his biggest fan in the chat <laughs> terry does have that dog in him i will say that he does I think last week Hakon was saying he's got that F1 Riz. So I love having Terry on as a as a guest. He does. Of the show. We're gonna we're gonna have him eat avocado toast on the stream sometime, just so we can prove that it's real. <laughs> Rob, well, do you, you want to pull up a couple more yes. lineups so we can get into that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> At least it should be. Yeah. So we had this one on on screen just before we cut to our technical correspondent. Uh, Leaps Frog, another uh, regular of the show, has submitted a couple of different lineups. I'm going to hazard a guess this looks like, I don't know, two options, I'm, I'm going to say, because the, the far right-hand side of the screen looks pretty much identical to me. I think it's a, a Leclerc, Sergeant, Red Bull. Oh, sorry, is that just... Leclerc and Sargent versus Perez, oh, sorry, Stroll, Perez, Hockenberg versus Alonso, Leclerc, Sargent. That's interesting. He can afford Leclerc and Alonso with the two big constructors. That's powerful. Mm. That's got to be a bigger lineup than anything we have because we can only afford the lineup on the left with Stroll and something slightly better than Sargent. Yeah, I wonder if that budget could get you to a max Red Bull Ferrari. That's it would be very close. Yeah, you can afford that because I think you need one oh four eight to get the very bottom of mm. the the Max Red Bull Ferrari. Max is what thirty. I think you might just be short to be honest, but I don't hate the lineup. It's it looks great. Um, oh, wow. I'd be happy with either of those to be honest with you because we're basically considering the the diet versions of the two of those. It's either mm. Perez and Joe or Leclerc and Stroll. So. It depends I mean, if you want the points upside, but not the price upside, possibly Perez. If you want the price upside, I'd say the lineup on the 
at the Leclerc lineup. Yeah, I agree. Leap's actually saying he can get to a max Red Bull Ferrari, but has some concern around the lower budget options over the longer term. And you're not wrong. I think they probably are a bit risky with price decreases if they don't get through an entire race. So maybe that is a, probably a more conservative approach where in the Ferrari case, the Leclerc Ferrari case, you've still got some budget upside. And then, you know, in a week or two's time, you can get to a, a reliable budget option build with Max Red Bull Ferrari. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty good spot to be in, to be completely that's a honest. That's problem to have. Mm, mm. Absolutely. I can't fault either lineup, to be quite honest. So, Same. Yeah, I like both, which is probably not the answer you want to hear when you submit two options. I will. If 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 you make me commit, I'm going to say the lineup on the left. I yeah. like you have two stud constructors. Leclerc, I think, is a good look for the 2X driver. And then Alonso is the number two. Definitely the safer of the two Aston Martins. You're taking the zero from Sargent, but I think that's better than mm. taking your chances with double Haas. Like Terry said, that track evolution or that blocking in qualifying could set one of them up to lose positions in the mm. race. Yep, 100%. I like left two. All righty. This one we have from Ty Fox. Ty, if I've said that right. Let me just zoom out. I think I've... Uh... Leclerc, Stroll, Magnussen, Joe, Albon. To be completely honest, this might actually be my lineup for this week. <laughs> I approve. So, yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Um, I like Stroll for the price increases and Leclerc. I honestly think this is the best shot he's got of winning a race from the three we've had so far. So I'm pretty confident with that team. You throw in Magnussen and Joe, who are usually Q1 exits, and I think that's the uh, yeah makings of a, a good baseline for your fantasy team. Very good. I'll leave this one to you, Adam. Ah, so our producer, Greg, put our fantasy showdown. So for anyone who hasn't seen our content this week, we had Chris McCarthy from F1 TV on the show. He set his lineup based on our recommendations back when we filmed the show last weekend. And at the time, Ferrari hadn't totally emerged yet, but he set a very solid lineup at the left-hand side of your screen. It features Red Bull Ferrari with Perez and then just a safe complement of budget drivers for the rest of his team. You can see where I'm looking right now. I know I have to have Red Bull and Ferrari. I'd like to have Lance in there, but I can if I bring in Perez. So that means I'm leaning toward Leclerc right now. And then with my third unused transfer, I'll probably move from Ricardo or Albon for either Yuki or Joe, depending on where the money fits. So you can see Chris and I are going head-to-head -head this week for bragging rights and we've got a little bet going on on the side too if you haven't seen that content yet we had a full-length interview with him and then a little vignette in our fantasy preview for australia this week yeah i i mean the one glaring difference between your two lineups is um you having lance stroll in there whereas he's got pierre gasly uh and then magnus and ricardo let's assume we you guys both go perez or i mean perez leclerc are pretty evenly matched I uh what's what's your take on Ricardo? Because you've got you you are you only burning two trades for Ferrari Ferrari and your DRS boost? Would you consider downgrading Ricardo or would you prefer to remove Stroll in that situation? So it depends, right? If I go with Perez, that means I can't afford Stroll and my third transfer would just be to knock Stroll down to the best available budget driver. If I have a third transfer left. I don't really like any of the three budget drivers on the bottom. I think Yuki has the higher upside than Ricardo this week. I think Joe has a slightly higher upside than Batas. But like you said, at a pseudo home track budget upside, I think I can talk myself into liking him. And then Albon's not even in his own car. So dude, there's reasons to be pessimistic about all three of them. I know I'm going to sub one of them out. Yeah, fair enough. I really like Stroll from what we've already talked about. He's just... He's one I'm really trying to do my best to keep this week. So you never know. We could again have close to similar, but one or two differences is always a good thing when we're going head to head. And I think Absolutely. honestly, I, I I think I like your team compared to Chris's. But again, it's your neck on the line against him, not mine. So it's easy for me to say. I'll feel kind of dirty if I win. I had the benefit of all the free practice sessions, and he <laughs> didn't. So, um, if but if I lose, then it's even more egg on my face because I I overthought it. Now, this one is quite fascinating to me. We've not seen too many lineups like this where we've seen triple premium drivers 
someone who's very, very optimistic on Ferrari and you're probably hoping for a max DNF or something like that to really expect a, a favorable result for this team. This is this is something. I don't think I've seen this in all of the, the lineups that we've looked at so far. So I'm not sure triple Ferrari is as wise as dumping one of those Ferrari drivers and putting Red Bull in as a constructor because they're just so much more powerful than anyone else. Because remember, unlike the drivers, you get the, the bonus for both drivers making Q3, which is pretty much a lot for Red Bull. Fastest pit stops, Red Bull usually gets at least one. I what I struggle to think that Haas would be able to match some of that to make some of this worthwhile. Yeah, look, I mean, is is this team angling for a budget increase given Ferrari's perhaps slightly underpriced standing at the moment? I, I mean, I think again, you want the Red Bull constructor in there because of Max and Perez. Haas. I'm all for having one Haas driver, but the, the constructor, I just can't see scoring more than 20 or 30 points in a single race week. So you're taking a big risk, ex hoping Max finishes outside of the points or not finishing the race altogether, which I just don't see happening. And yeah, it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. Like if that's play your own game, I always say that to everyone that that has their own strategy in mind, but it is probably not the most points, the highest point ceiling that i'm saying so just to compare red bull on the season uh, 179 points haas on the season 28 <laughs> so that that's the 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 pointer for me and mm. god forbid anything happens to nico hulkenberg you're gonna get hit twice so i i worry about that i mean what if 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 for instance i'm just trying to pair this with a question in the chat what if you have two what if you have red bull and two ferrari drivers I still think you're better off going for Red Bull constructor, Ferrari constructor, just because you're getting two Ferrari drivers and two Red Bull drivers as opposed to going for just, or if I have, I'm pretty sure I've said exactly the same thing, but I think you've got to prioritize the constructors. If there's anything we've learned through two races, constructors should be first and foremost. I mean, you, you made a great point last week, I think, and it maybe the, the strategy has changed a little bit where you're like, pick your DRS boost, then pick your constructor one, then pick your constructor two. I almost wonder if it's kind of diverged a little bit where you're going, pick your constructor one, then pick your DRS boost, then pick your constructor two or something like that. It's changed so quickly already. And part of the reason why you and I are so passionate about this is we ran with the power constructor and the weak constructor with RB the first two weeks and just got absolutely fried from it. So we're just trying mm. to to stop our viewers from running into the same traps that we ran into. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go a couple more teams. Let's knock them out of the park. We could probably take on a couple more questions in the chat and then target the contest entries. That sounds good. The beauty of not having qualifying at the top of the hour is we can go past the top of the hour. Yeah. I'm I'm all for an hour and 15 minute stream if you want to keep talking. <laughs> whatever wh whatever we can do to get everybody's question answered this time I think will will be a great Definitely. service to everybody. Definitely. This team Logan Sargent the looks like this team's been submitted by the time the inactive assignment came through on the F1 fantasy website. So yes. That's that's a guaranteed zero points if you've got him there. And then, oh my goodness, this is the first Max Verstappen, Red Bull, and Ferrari lineup we've seen. Yes. This is the cheapest assets in the game, Max, Red Bull, Ferrari versus, wow, Perez, Leclerc, Red Bull, Aston Martin. I'm a little bit stunned by this, Rob. Do you have any initial thoughts? <laughs> this, is, this, this kind of reminds me of an extremely rare trading card that you just would never see and you see it presented in front of yourself you're like wow this someone actually can get to this lineup um personally if i could get to the the, the max red bull ferrari i would just yolo on that lineup for me um because there's only going to be so many weeks until everyone else is able to do that so i think yes um was it was it ty fox earlier who who mentioned or, or was it leaps i think it was who mentioned before that you can get he, you can afford it but you prefer not to go in that direction i think that's a very kind of sensible approach but i also am just tempted by the allure of having max red bull and ferrari as the best driver and the two best constructors in your team for the next couple of weeks if you can afford it 
That's how I feel too. Max Red Bull Ferrari can almost guarantee you 200 points and the rest is just details. And I think the Ferrari constructor, Batas and one of the Haases will get you a little bit of price increase that you can slowly start maneuvering them out of there. And honestly, this is probably the best week to run mm-hmm. Logan Sargent while you've got, um, while you have to, or if you have to, because you're not, you're, you're obviously having to go for the cheapest option in the game, but he's, he's not going to score negative points this week. So if you want to take a risk with the lowest priced asset, then you may as well. Mm-hmm. I'm um, yes. yeah, team team one on the left for me. Team um, one, just, just because of the boldness. Shadow, that's looking good to me. Hmm. I think Don't I'll change have a thing. I think that's my exact team. Make probably. sure to apply your two X DRS boost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to forget. Yes. Easy to forget. Um, let's let's run through some questions in the chat. Hundred percent. And. I can see I can see a few popping up here. Nobody's mentioned Oscar Piastri yet. Ray, I think the problem with that is that to run Oscar, you would have to downgrade your 2x driver. And to, to do that, I think you'd just be at a points deficit between the two of them or downgrade a constructor, which we, we keep harping on is it's burned us the last two weeks. And we don't want that to happen to either of you too. So as much as I think Piastri is going to put up a P5, P6, performance this week i just can't quite get him in the way we did last year yeah i'm i'm the same and i think when budgets increase mclaren's slightly dearer price tag for um compared to ferrari i think it's going to be really um interesting to see whether or not we pivot in that direction but we had that wager last season on the topic of australians in formula one the the australian on a podium wager where every time that happened i'd do a shoey or something on stream and I'm happy to continue the theme of that this season. But for those of you, the more eagle-eyed of you, I've got uh, a little bit of Vegemite here. So maybe if Oscar Piastri um, comes through with a podium, I could do, I wouldn't say a shoey of Vegemite, but I'm happy to eat a bit of Vegemite on toast or something of the sorts if, if there's enough interest there. Fantastic. You're a braver man than me, Rob. Um. All right. So more questions from the chat. Caroline asks, what's the reasoning behind Batas over Joe? For us, it was simply a matter of we saw Joe was going to be out last week. We subbed in Batas and now we're using our our transfers to get to a Red Bull Ferrari, probably Leclerc lineup. So we just ran out of transfers to move batas i like show a little bit better for the overtakes i think rob likes batas a little bit better because of the pseudo home track advantage and the price boost so they're evenish yeah i mean i i do have three trades if i go leclerc i may have just enough budget to get joe in if i wanted to it's it's a tough one it is a coin flip i think it's probably closer between joe and botas than it has been the last couple of weeks so i'm fascinated to see how fp3 shakes out it could be very well that whichever one seems to look more off the pace i just keep in my team or bring into my team but um yeah these these salvo guys i think that the car isn't nearly as bad as what we thought it was going to look like in preseason. no so christopher asked in the chat what is the best team with max verstappen so judging just from f1 fantasy tools they say take the pun on sergeant and do red bull ferrari verstappen sonoda double sauber sergeant that is the highest point score of a verstappen um a verstappen red bull ferrari team Mm. but if let's say you can't get to verstappen and oh sorry let's say you can't afford a verstappen ferrari red bull and you're just slightly constrained i've got f1 fantasy tools up on the screen here if say we go let's just say you want to go ferrari uh, verstappen and red bull i'll just select those do you have any inkling do you have i'd I'd imagine imagine it would put you with like aston martin that's my guess too yeah Uh, and then it starts to look like the rest of our lineups where you have stroll and three budgets should we say uh yeah should we say a budget of what one i'm 101.1 what are you 101.5 i'm gonna guess so maybe 102 103 i think i'm actually closer to you i've had a tough yeah tough go with let's, let's just let's just put 102.5 let's see what that spits out <clears throat> but i think yeah aston martin max verstappen and then the usual suspects in the budget category
Um, but yeah, that's uh, an interesting one. Aston Martin. I mean, I think it's Ferrari Red Bull for me. And then, as you say, the diet template with Perez or Leclerc. But but yeah, Agreed. looking good. Ray in the chat says, you started with Verstappen, Ferrari, Mercedes, move to Verstappen, Ferrari, McLaren. I agree. If the if if your options are Mercedes versus McLaren, I think all signs are pointing to McLaren this week. Mercedes seems um, they seem lost. Yeah, they do. They do. They do. So I was just uh, observing a bit of the uh, banter going on around the Vegemite. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Listen, just keep it away from me. That's fine. I tried it once, and that's enough for a lifetime. Um, Alligator said. Um, same team as me and three transfers. Why Leclerc over Perez? Would you take Perez, Alonso, and Aston Martin instead? Uh, look, I, I'll be completely honest, and Adam's unfortunately been subject to my back and forth on Perez versus Leclerc all day. But uh, as it stands, I think up until the pre-practice sessions, I was leaning towards Perez because he just seems to be in a car that performs consistently better over a full race distance. Leclerc's just looked into practice sessions much better. I also think the potential, I'm not going to say this is a big factor in my decision making, but the potential for driver of the day, if Leclerc does qualify on pole, wins the race, or if he qualifies P3 or gets up to P2, I think he's in a pretty good, has a pretty good shot of winning that. Um, and the car itself just looks much more competitive as well. It's the closest rival to Red Bull. I think they win with the best chance of getting close to winning the race so if if Leclerc can get on the front row uh I think he's got a very good shot um the car just looks good across the board so that's yeah. kind of where I'm at at the moment and I probably would I am leaning Perez slash Leclerc and Red Bull Ferrari I don't know if I could really entertain Aston Martin despite how good they look a little bit through um the first day of practice same here all the way down. I think I would just add Leclerc as a, a bigger price gain candidate in my mind. And also he looked really good when he won this race two years ago. He got taken out last year, so I don't fault him for that. Looks like he could be a lock for the front row this year. So a lot of good reasons to be drinking that Ferrari Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, we're past the hour limit. I'm not saying we're going to go for another hour, but we could probably go for a little longer, cover off the yeah. last few questions and you... lock in the contest. Yeah, that sounds good. And a related question with Ferrari, Ty Fox asked, how long until McLaren fights Ferrari for P3 and P4? I would start looking at Imola. So if they can start bringing those European upgrades, this is when they started making the surge last year. It was around Canada that they made the surge. If they can be as effective this year as they were last year, sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah, I think McLaren, they're, they're the closest team to Ferrari at the moment. Um, what... One one thing that uh, Levi's mentioned is no negative. Now, that's probably something that's maybe flown under the radar a little bit in the stream, but I've had a few questions asked of that because of how many DNS typically can happen at Australia. We had eight last season. We talked about this in the previous show earlier in the week, three, the previous two races before 2023, and then anywhere between five and eight in the years before the pandemic. I think it's not a bad shout at all, but I think my point of view is probably similar to how you want to approach using it for later in the year. Agreed. Le leaning toward later in the year, and it's it's going to be a very anxious race for us to watch because inevitably you're going to have a few of these drivers DNF, which is one of the fan amp pick of the week questions is how many DNFs do you think there's going to be? Rob says there's going to be more than four. I think I picked three. So be sure to head over to the fan amp app and weigh in because I'll be interested to see what our group of strategists thinks. I'm holding on to no negative till later in the year. That's when the parts tend to break down. This is when the circuits heat up and tend to trigger some mistakes. And we, there was a massive spike in DNFs after you know August or so. Yeah. Look, I don't think it's a bad idea if you want to use it this weekend. By all means, it it seems to be the the, the race so far this year that seems to be the most relevant. Uh, but for now, I'll probably hold. Um, Ricardo in Australia, Adam. A lot of advertising around him at his home race. I'm not so sure if I'm going to be able to stomach having him, but he won't be in my team at all this weekend, unlike perhaps you. We talked about the three budget drivers on my team earlier. Albon, Ricardo, Batas. I think I'm most likely to sub out Ricardo. 
either for his teammate or for Joe. <laughs> Just got to prove it to me. If, if he gets a couple of couple of good races together, if they start showing the promise that we're seeing in these sims, I'm going to believe in them. But I'm just I'm scorned these last few weeks. Arby's really put us at a at a deficit, so I need to mm. try to distance myself from Danny Rick a little bit. Yeah, yeah. All right, I might um enter the names into uh, for yeah. the contest question in. It, it seems like a slightly smaller week, so a slightly higher chance of winning this week than. Than those previous, but not necessarily a bad result. For I'm gonna, I'll wins. bust through a few in the a few chat questions while you while you get that up. Um, Joseph asks: Stroll with wildcard or Albon already used two transfers for Ferrari and Red Bull. Oof. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a likely story. I think I would hold off on it. Stroll has the higher points upside. Stroll has the higher price gain upside. I don't know if I would use a chip just for this, the the honor of bringing Stroll in. No, no, I, I it's, it's not. I, I wouldn't be using chips on one quasi budget versus another, uh, nor would I be taking a minus 10 because it can sometimes not go the way you intend. So I would personally just hold for Albon um because the last thing you want happen is stroll to suddenly dnf and the whole point of using the wild card hinged on that particular driver who's not even finished the race so i'd be probably in more cases than not using it when i've got to take a minus 20 or a minus 30 like in terry's case this week sounds good all right let's fire up that contest rob yep okay so very small group this week as i said but good odds for everybody yeah exactly It's Shadow. All right. Congratulations, Shadow. We'll be in touch with you to get you your fifth gear Garms gift certificate. And be sure to play every week because we'll be doing this every race throughout the season. We're so excited to be back with our partners at Fifth Gear Garms. I love their merch. Their 2024 line just dropped. Very pleased. Yeah. And the uh, the two prints in the, the background here are from Fifth Gear Garms as well. So they've got not just awesome t shirts, but great prints and photos that you can also. Um, hang on your wall or do whatever you please with them so check them out and we've got a discount code fantasy 10 as well if you choose to ultimately take a look at some of their stuff a lot of a lot of guarantees in the chat hakan says he's going to win next time best of luck to you and then there was a guarantee from ty fox in the chat hulk on the podium this year i'm calling it this is the year if he doesn't That's land a podium year. this year it, he will have broken the record for most grand prix starts with no podiums yeah, it'd be a terrible, terrible record to hold if he retired and still hadn't managed to crack a top three. So he would have as many podiums as Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's the it's the best Haas car we've seen since the Stone Age. It seems like so. I think if there's any chance, it's probably this year. Cool. All right, Rob. Any final thoughts before we call it a night? uh no I'd, I'd actually love to get your your top three prediction for this week before i don't usually ask for one but i i have a, a, a sneaking suspicion um there could be a bit of a, a different outcome than we might ordinarily have so what's your what's your top take i'm ready for this because it's another one of the the fan amp pickums for the week so i think max is gonna win again charles is gonna finish second and i'm gonna cop out i'm gonna say perez is third what about okay you? Mine's slightly different. I've got in P3, Oscar Piastri, home Grand Prix podium. P2, Max Verstappen. P1, Charles Leclerc. Ooh. Wow. You've been yeah. watching P1 with Matt and Tommy lately, haven't you? Uh, I'm not that delusional, <laughs> but I am confident that it's going to be his best race of the season. And, you know, if Oscar gets on the podium, uh, you might get a shoey from me. You might get a bit of Vegemite from me. Who knows? So, yeah. I want it Os just for that. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Let's go, Oscar. Wonderful. Keep an eye on our socials for the rest of the night. We're going to stay up and watch FP3, then lock in our lineup so you can tell what we're leaning toward. Charles, Red Bull, Ferrari, three budget drivers, probably Lance Stroll in the last spot. And yep. we'll be sure to lock that in in case there's anything crazy. 
And feel free to keep asking us questions through our socials and the FanAmp app. We've got six more hours until lineups lock. I'll be up for most of that. So feel free to keep asking us questions. So, same will I. So I know we're just trying to, to be as receptive and, and conducive to all the different time zones, but another great show. And thanks for everyone that dropped through in the chat. It's been a, a, a great episode today. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us and enjoy the race.